Welcome to We Are DB. I am Brenton, joined as always by Danielle. That's me. Thanks for joining us this week as we count up the IMDb's best movies of all time and discuss some of the greatest films you mightn't ever have seen. This week, Redditor's number 46 on the Internet Movie Database by millions of film lovers from around the world is Whiplash. <laughs> Released in 2014, starring Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons as the two leads, Whiplash is a jazz drama, if that were a genre, set in the fictional Schaefer Conservatory of Music, which is obviously based on the Juilliard School in New York City, which is undoubtedly the best school in the world for the performing arts. I was wondering about that. I'm like, I always knew Juilliard was like the school, and so I was wondering... What's this Schaefer? Okay. Well, this was filmed at Juilliard, and it's meant to be that kind of school. Um, so maybe there was a legal thing as to why they couldn't actually set this at Juilliard. Yeah, okay. But it's, it's pretty much meant to be there. Um, it's a very prestigious school. Uh, okay. This movie is written and directed by Damien Chazelle. Um, so one of its five Oscar nominations was for Best Adapted Screenplay, making me think that it was based on something before. Um, you know how... In order to get ready for a feature film or to show it to investors, movie makers will make like a short film. Yes. So it's technically based on the short film by Chazelle that he made to show investors to back the feature. But because he showed it at the Sundance Film Festival, um, that became its own property. And making this movie ineligible for original screenplay, it had to be based on his short film, which ironically was based on this film so it was kind of like a interesting thing so this is technically damien chazelle's second feature film but since his first was like an independent black and white movie from five years earlier that was written produced shot edited and directed by himself and only made thirty five thousand dollars i kind of really count whiplash as his first yeah um he then went on to win best director oscar for his next project, which was La La Land, uh, and then he made First Man with Ryan Gosling. So he hasn't done a lot, but he's very quickly become one that I really want to watch from now on. Kind of up-and-coming yeah. director. So Whiplash is kind of an interesting look into what people will actually do to reach their goals, Um And this guy's goal is to be the best. And it's basically his journey as to what he's willing to do. And it's interesting to watch Miles Teller in that role, just like pushing himself and pushing himself. And Mm. that's basically what it is. It's just like this study into what he's willing to do to reach perfection. Did you, did you like this movie? That's a, that's a complicated question. Okay. Um, so... You had a kind of an interesting time watching this one because... Reaction. Yeah, yeah, this is basically Anxiety the movie. And you have anxiety, so it was a little difficult for you. Yes. Did I like this movie? I did like this movie. I was very surprised at the reaction I had to this movie. Basically, I haven't felt this affected by a film since we watched Brokeback Mountain. And we spoke on that one as to why that one touched you is because it reminded you of home and it reminded you of people that you knew. Yeah. So there was a number of personal things there. Which was very similar for this one because... So I have an anxiety disorder and there were moments that were very confrontational and abusive. There were interactions in this movie that were abusive that I just found very um, difficult to process Mm. um so it made me at one point very very uncomfortable well it was the first confrontation moment that it was the worst one it took you for surprise and that was kind of the point it was kind of what he's going for yeah um all that said i really liked the cinematography in this i liked the way it was filmed it felt very contemporary Mm. you know what i mean you know how much you love Arrival? Yes. That's how much I love this movie. 
This is one of my top favorite movies of all time. That's so interesting to me because, like, and I know I'm biased because my reaction to some of the content in this was so strong that I could not feel that way about this movie. Yeah. Not in a million years. Which I think, honestly, is a testament to the acting. Honestly. Yeah, to actually make you convinced that this is, like, real and this is happening and these confrontations are, like, something to be afraid or worried about. Yeah. So I'll give them that for sure. J.K. Simmons won the Best Supporting Oscar for this one. Yeah, so I think this movie is absolutely brilliant. It is so fantastic. There is no filler. I think everything that's in there is in there for a reason. And I just love it. I think it's I think it's a masterpiece. I think there's definitely with Andrew's character, so Miles Teller's character, um, a lot of character development and change that you can see that's really the character arc that he takes. Yeah, I think it's very realistic. Um just some of his reactions to things. Some decisions that I wouldn't make, but... I actually noticed in this viewing that there's actually a really great use of color throughout because oh. every shot is sort of like the entire frame is lit up as a color. And then it could could change from, like, everything you see here is green, the very next shot is everything here is red, the next scene is everything here is yellow... Um. And I hadn't really noticed that before. I don't really know what he was going for, but it feels almost like a dream. Like it's like it's kind of an artistic choice that he's done there. Um, well, I didn't I didn't pick up on it, but I would think I didn't pick up on it originally. That use of color subliminally creates ambiance. So yeah, especially you would see a lot of red probably in the confrontational scenes. Well, those were sort of mixed so that's what i was looking for i'm like is it green when he's more comfortable and red when he's uncomfortable and i was trying to think of what the themes were that he was trying to put and there wasn't really a pattern um because some of the confrontation ones were like yellow and blue which is kind of interesting it could even just be that like throwing something new at your brain every time just to make it more confusing and more yeah make it feel like it's on edge or whatever yeah keep it on its toes I'm just thinking, like, do I think this was a well-made movie? Yes. Do I think it was a good movie? Yes. J.K. Simmons' character, Fletcher, is very hell-bent on trying to get the best out of his students. And there's a dialogue piece towards the end there where he's talking with Miles Teller. And he says that, like, you need to push people past their limits to achieve greatness. Mm -hmm. and so that's what he's really trying to do. But what he's doing is really just abuse, like really yes. abusive. And Miles Teller's reaction to that is, what if you discourage someone from ever being a great person? Because what if you push, push them, them far. so far? And I don't like Fletcher's response because he says a great person would never be discouraged, and I think that's bullshit because we're all human, and that's how he's justifying these actions, this psychopathic tendency to abuse people and push themselves where they shouldn't be pushed to. I totally agree. And I remember, like, right in the beginning, there's so many signs that this person, like, there's something not right with this guy. Like, in his head? Yeah. Like, the very first thing I wrote down was, what the fuck is this guy's problem? Yeah, was that from the very first scene, the very first introduction to it's, the characters? It's gotta be. Yeah. Right? It's gotta be even from the first couple of interactions where he's just, he's so arrogant and rude. He's very arrogant. And then once Andrew actually gets into the core studio band, you can see, like, he's manipulative and he's, like, he probes him for information that he's gonna use against him later. Like, just, to me, that's not something normal people do. Yeah. That's something evil people do. It's interesting that you picked up on that in the very first confrontation scene, right? So that's not really spoilers to say that, like, in that scene, he even pulls Andrew aside and, and starts to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. He's like, don't let it get to you. Just relax. Keep calm. He asks him about his personal life. He finds the information that knows that he's going to get to him later. He finds his weakness. And then when 
he's in there in the studio. He talks him up. He says he's the best, you know. He's, like, saying how good he is. And then he throws a fucking chair at his head. Yeah. Like, that's not something normal people do. No, of course not. And he would justify that. I don't know how you would justify that. Yeah. I don't know how bringing up the shitty, uncomfortable, private points of someone's life is going to push them. Yeah, I think you know? he's he's just trying to use it as a driving point, right? If I didn't do that, then you wouldn't... It's kind of like that scene from Fight Club, where he goes to... Uh, it's like a convenience store or a petrol station or something. Oh, that's right, where he's and like, he, tomorrow will be the best day of his life. Tomorrow will be the best day of your life, because he points the gun at the guy's head and says, if you're not in veterinary school by the time I check in, then I'm going to kill you. And then tomorrow, he's going to be more motivated than any other day in his life. And that's the mentality, right? So, Tyler Durden is not really a character that we should achieve to be, you know? That guy's a psychopath as well. I don't like that mode of thinking because that, to me, shows that you don't understand human emotion. That you don't have a regard for people, but also that you don't understand people and how people think. Because in your head, you're like, oh, well, I just motivated them. No, you didn't. You fucking traumatized them. Yeah. And when you traumatize people, you you basically press a pause button, if not, if not a rewind button. And his response to that is, great people wouldn't be traumatized? Are you fucking stupid? Yeah. If anything, those people, and I'm saying this based on, like, past history, a lot of great people who have been so talented are already unstable yes and they end up become a lot of them die early because they're unstable and they're easily traumatized (laughs) it's a very common thread with people who are great yeah and it's even brought up in this movie van gogh cut off his ear or whatever people are yeah so like that's a stupid uneducated like unjustified and also like already proven wrong method of thinking and line of reasoning and it just shows me that fletcher if he's not a psychopath he's definitely got some sort of instability going on and he definitely doesn't understand people yeah he's got some sort of personality disorder i I think he is a narcissist because he does he can't see things the way other people do he can only see them the way he sees them the scene where he builds him up and then immediately cuts him back down. Do you think that's one of the reasons why this is called Whiplash? Because it's like, everything's going smoothly, he's getting built up, he's getting up to a high, and then, bam, throws a chair at him. Like... It it could be. The character's getting Whiplash. He's like, what the hell? Well, I mean, obviously it's because of the song. It was like... It is because of the song. But there's a lot of moments in this that are like that, you know? And then he physically gets whiplash when he has a car well, accident then, later on, like, you know what I mean? He keeps, he rolls, and then he gets blindsided, and it happens about five different times in this movie that I can think of, like, with the end scene, with with the music, and the, like, when he is bleeding all over the drum kit and everything, like, yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it, because it does happen again and again and again and again. Yeah. It's something that he's really not expecting, and all of a sudden it takes like his hairpin turn, and he's not expecting it at all. So you kind of feel this whiplash. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting sort of study into these two people's characters and how they play off each other and what their motivations and drives are, Um, because there's absolutely people out there like this. I I, I just don't understand, like... How could you be so hell-bent on ruining someone's life? He's he not in his mind though. He doesn't think that he's ruining his life. He thinks Later he's making on, it though. better. I think yeah. I think he um I think we've all sort of had these moments where we've come across these sort of people or been in these situations and it's kind of just interesting to show this in a movie uh, so b- brilliantly as it is. I think this is a perfect encapsulation of these feelings and that's why i think it's brilliant definitely if that makes any sense i always say if you're able to elicit such an emotional response from me you must be doing your job right you know yeah 
from this point forward, we'll probably go into more heavy spoilers. That was more of a general idea as to what you can expect from the characters. Um, towards the end there, when he is having that interaction with Andrew, he says something... Because I'd heard of this movie before, and people had said to me... I'd, I'd heard of the quote that he says to Andrew, where he says... There is no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. And I thought that meant, having not seen the movie, it's like, oh, you know, good job. You know, it's just like sarcastic. It's insulting. It's like, oh, you, you're just saying you, you don't actually mean that. It's just something that people say. Mm -hmm. But then when I actually watched it, I realized it's a lot more than that. What he's actually trying to say is, you should never encourage people. If you say good job, no one's pushed to do extra. You know, you have to say that was a terrible job so that they try to do a good job tomorrow. If that makes sense. Like, that's, that's that quote says a lot to me about who he is and how he thinks. Again, it's so wrong because if you never... Eventually someone will give up if they never ever get any sort of praise... Most people will eventually just give up. Yes, but you have to understand that he doesn't care about those people. Those people didn't really have their heart in it if they gave up. Because he was even talking about his student, Sean Casey, who was a squeaker. He just got in, right? He wasn't good, but he pushed himself. And the next day he was better, and the next day he was better, and then he was one of the greats. So he'd think that the people who are discouraged are the people who shouldn't be here anyway. He's saying that, like, if you say good job, you're you're harming the development of humans, basically, is what he's saying, because you're not getting the most out of people. And I found that fascinating. And it's I think it's a lot deeper than what I originally first thought it was. Because he says it's, there's no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. I think there's a job. line. There's absolutely a line. And anyone with who can think properly there's can see that. There's a point, like, I get it. But there's a point where if if no one ever got any praise, they'd never keep going. And so you wouldn't have progress anyway. Yeah, it's kind of positive versus negative reassurance. Yeah. I don't really know music, so I, I looked it up. 200 beats per minute is considered very, very fast with this yeah. jazz music. And Caravan is like 330, Whiplash is 250, and by the end he's asking for yeah. 400. That's double what's considered very, very fast. Are you kidding me? Um, so that puts it in more of a perspective as to what is he actually asking of these students. It's unrealistic. And if they can't reach an unrealistic goal, then they're failures. And that's kind of bullshit. Yeah, I agree. I wonder if Fletcher even, like, realizes that he ultimately is the one who killed Casey. I don't think he does. Now, I found it interesting because he told the class that that boy died in a car accident do you think he knew that he had actually killed himself he must have right he must have known that he had killed himself but he thought no that's going to discourage them so i'm going to say it was a car accident and use his upcoming story as the thing that i'm going to use to motivate them the death is not what's going to motivate them so he's kind of manipulating the story to fit his own agenda and that's exactly what this person does i honestly i wonder do you think he was more sad about the fact that this kid died or about the fact that the world lost this great musician or the fact that he, in his eyes, gave up? I don't know if he was sad at all. I think he was just pretending to be sad to get the best out of the students that were sitting in front of him. The whole thing was probably an act. If I go in there with, with these tears in my eyes and act like he was really important to me, they'll think that, I think they're important or something. You know what I, I mean? Like, maybe he didn't care at all. I think all. he cared some because the day before when he got that phone call, he went into his office and Andrew goes in there. That's what that yeah. phone call was, right? Andrew okay. went in there or that morning or whatever. Um, and he's like, I could play this. And he's like, not now. Like, he gets mad at him, right? And tells him to go away. Like, he's obviously affected okay. somewhat. I'm just wondering... Does he feel bad because he lost this person? Or does he feel bad because he lost this masterpiece? Which is honestly an object. I think it was yeah. the second one. And I don't think that he can ever make the connection that his actions 
led to him killing himself. No, I think... Because I think he did. Even though he killed himself years after he was actually working under him, it was ultimately his sort of actions that led to that, and I think that that's what is shown. Can I go a bit of a tangent here? Talk about a bit of a personal anecdote that's sort of beside the movie. Because this made me... This really rings true to me now more than ever because for those of you who know me, know that I have an architecture background. I have a Bachelor of Architectural Design. And three days ago, I had the biggest presentation of my career. And... It was basically a project that I was working on for eight months. And it was part of my honors degree, Bachelor of Design honors, majoring in architectural studies. This was the very last one for the end of four years of study. It was a 30-minute presentation in front of the senior lecturer. He was like the head of the department. Sit down. He said, present all of your work. Give whatever you can give. So I printed... What was it? 56 pages. This is A1. So it's like two feet by three feet per page. Like these massive posters, panels. Spent over $200 just printing. I had models. 30 minutes. And it was to give my all. To show you exactly what I could do in my field. And I ultimately failed. He, he, he's not, he's not like this guy in abusive, but he's like this guy in perfection. He wants, to get the best out of people. And what I presented wasn't good enough. So I kind of felt like Miles Teller's character this week. Like I was physically sick all day. I was shaking and I couldn't like, this is, this is it. You know, it kind of reminded me of that competition in the movie where in the middle of the movie. Yeah. Where he forgets his sticks and he has to go get the car. Um, that's that's basically how I felt for the last seven days leading up to this point. And what I did still wasn't good enough. So ultimately, the reason for that was the last 12 months have been one of the hardest years of my life, to be completely honest. I went through a bout of anxiety and depression that I hadn't really experienced for a very long time. Um, and it, it, essentially, that's what affected my work. And I'll admit that. Um but because I was I was always striving to try and push myself past my own limits. For the first three years of my undergrad, I didn't really achieve anything less than a distinction grade because I was pushing and pushing and I barely scraped by in this fourth year because of my mental health. So by the time Andrew Neiman gets expelled from Schaefer, He's kind of faced with an identity crisis. He doesn't really know where to go. And like that was his life. That was his goal. And this is that was his only way of being able to achieve it. And that's kind of how I feel this week, which is kind of interesting as a reflection. I could see myself Mm -hmm. in this character. Um, It's just interesting to me that we decided to record this one this week after the week that I've had has been one of the most difficult ones. And I I feel like that I've just tried to get the most out of myself, similar to how this character was portrayed. Um, It's just an interesting contrast, I guess. And I think it also shows what can happen if you push it too far. Yeah. So it's like, imagine that scenario where I'm already like, anxious and depressed and I have this teacher with perfection and then he abuses me that's basically where he's at you know what I mean like it it wasn't it wasn't like that but that's basically where Miles Teller's character's at and it's something that a lot of people wouldn't experience right like you have to really be pushing yourself and ambitious to really get to there um even though you know we've all had moments where we can sort of relate to it I guess If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really think that that... I love that scene at the end. Like where they're at the JVC. They're in front of all those people. And Fletcher had basically invited him to fuck Neiman over, right? He knows that the people in the audience can ruin his career. 
which is basically why he's there. And it's interesting that, like, he invited him along to fuck with him at risk of sabotaging his own gig at this thing. That's how much he's hell-bent on getting revenge on this kid. You know what I mean? That just shows a lot for his character. It just shows me how unstable he is. Um, Yeah. Now, you had said that you thought this was the perfect ending. I think this is one of the most perfect endings I've ever seen in cinema. It's, I think it's brilliant, and I couldn't think of this movie being ending any other way. Okay, see, I hated it, so I want to hear why you think it's so really? fantastic. Yeah. Well, well, for starters, Neiman gets fucked over. He goes off stage, and I think that's where most of us would leave it. But he owns it. He's like, no, fuck you. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to show you how good I am, and I'm going to fuck you around while doing it. So I think that's the really, like, yes kind of moment, you know what I mean? So it's satisfying to see him go back out there. It's satisfying to see him just go and go and go. He goes from one song to the next, and he's just, he's using the music as revenge, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, So there's that, but then there's also where it really gets towards the end. And you see this first when he hits the cymbal and it's off-put. So then Fletcher comes in and he fixes his symbol for him and then he looks at him in the eyes and he's like, yes, yes, yes. I really think that by the end of this, right to the end of that scene, they have the utmost respect for each other. They might not like each other, they loathe each other, but they respect. Fletcher ultimately made him into exactly what he wanted him to be. He's become great in that scene and he's showing him that. He's just like, yes. I hate that because he actually didn't do anything. He didn't. So you hate it because you believe that he's going to go on for the rest of his life and say, yes, I'm justified in doing yeah. this abusive stuff now. I can see an argument for that. Well, and because I don't like how at the end, Andrew looks pleased with himself because he's actually finally got some sort of praise from Fletcher. I wouldn't give a shit by the end of this. Well, if I were him... I would finish off that song and then I would walk off and never see him again, obviously, right? I'm not going to work with this guy, but I, th- I, think, I think it's a great moment between the two that goes past their relationship, good I or just, bad. I didn't like that he seemed to be so happy about it, Fletcher, because for me, I would take satisfaction in seeing that he... I'd want him to feel so bad that he was so wrong. You know, and he doesn't. He's Neiman or Fletcher? Fletcher. You'd want him to feel bad. Yeah. See, Fletcher's ultimate goal was to get the best out of people. And even in that fucking him over, whether it was good or bad, that got the best out of him. He walked off stage and no, I'm not going to end it this way. I'm going to use that as motivation to go back on stage and fucking play like I've never played before. So that's essentially what his goal was, and that's what he ended up getting by the end. So even if he didn't like Neiman, he respected him for that. I think t- to not respect him is petty and immature. I really hated that there was this moment of connection between the two of them. Because to me, I would think that I wouldn't feel pleased that he's pleased with me. I'd be like, yeah, fucking told you so. You know? I'd still be angry. I can see that. I can see that. But I think the greater thing is that he's reached his potential. I think it's bigger than both of their petty hatred for each other. And I think that's represented very well. I can see what you're saying. I just, I still don't like it. And I don't All have right, to that's like fine. it. Yeah. I really love this movie. I think it's brilliant. I like the movie. I just didn't like that interaction. Um, yeah. I thought it was shot really well. I thought... It was written really well. It was... See, this is going to sound so contradictory. It was comfortable to watch in that the cinematography was easy on the eyes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. The actual interactions weren't at all comfortable to watch, but I mean, it it wasn't offensive to the senses. I remember in the very beginning, there was this drumming that lasted forever in a day, and I'm just like, fuck, can you get to the point now oh the anticipation yes yeah. <laughs> can i just say if you ever wanted to know like what's my type like what's the most attractive person i can, can think of it's melissa benoist in this movie his girlfriend 
Oh, really? She is gorgeous. And you said that you kind of agreed with the breakup scene. He goes to her and says, you're going to stand in my way at being great. And you, you're like, he's kind of right. While normal people would look at that and be like, you're an asshole. But at least he's got the decency to say, like, I'm sorry, but instead of being a jerk and kind of dragging you along through this, I want to make a clean break. And yeah, you'll be mad at me for now, but at least I won't put you through this hell. You know? And mad as I would be if someone did that to me, I'd be glad that they did it sooner than later. You know? But does he have to do it later? Or is his own drumming going to get in the way? It was more of a reflection on himself than it was on her. Yeah. And I appreciated the fact that he had enough insight to say, like, this is too important to me. I'm going to end up treating you like shit and you don't deserve that. You know? Yeah. So it's it's kind of an interesting scene because it's showing that his life is drumming. This is not a hobby. This isn't just what he does at school and then he goes home and does something else. This is all he does. Yeah. And I think that's a very cool inter- like the introduction to these characters because the very first time you see both of them, he's staying late. He's trying to practice, practice, practice. And then the interaction with Fletcher is nothing's ever good enough for him. And you can see that in like four minutes Mm -hmm. of a scene. You know exactly what to expect from these characters for the rest of the movie. Oh, he's an asshole and he's driven. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And I think that's a good introduction. And I think that breakups... It's like, there's nothing in here that doesn't progress the characters or the story. And that's why I think it's like, it's perfectly constructed. It's crafted cinema. Yeah. There's actually a... I don't remember if you remember from um, La La Land, Ryan Gosling is at a jazz restaurant Mm. and his boss fires him. It's J.K. Simmons at this jazz restaurant. And he's he's basically playing the same character. He's a complete asshole. I kind of wish that he was the same character because they do mention his name. They say Mr. Whatever um, because he's only in there for one or two scenes where he's yelling at Ryan Gosling. Mm-hmm. And it would be a nice little cameo just to see what happened to that character. He's he's working at a jazz restaurant or whatever because it fits really well in with his character arc and where he ended up going. Mm. Um, I wish that he had, he had just changed his name to, to Fletcher. That would have been a really cool cameo. Mm. Easter egg. So does this director like have a thing for jazz or something then? He must do because that yeah. independent movie that I was talking about was even a jazz-based thing. Hmm. It was about singing and dancing, I believe it was. Um, so I have, I haven't actually seen First Man, but I imagine there's not much of a jazz theme running through that, so it's a little different in his filmography. Yeah. And I think if you can handle some really intense confrontation, you'd probably really enjoy this movie. Like, it, it is a, a good movie and an enjoyable movie. There's just aspects of it that me, myself, I had difficulty with but i don't think that should reflect on the movie a lot of people would have some difficulty with some of the scenes yeah we have been danielle and brenton this week thanks for joining us feel free to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts check us out on all the socials we're most active on instagram you can follow us on facebook comment on soundcloud or youtube or support us on patreon we have every episode uncut and unedited as well as bonus episodes every month And all this extra content is unlocked and free to everyone. It's just Patreon is our platform for that content over at WeRDB on Patreon. And until next week, thanks for listening.